Thank you. You may be seated. You know, it's interesting that last verse ties in with what we said right before the offering, how little pieces of paper and small chunks of metal could not certainly buy our way into heaven. In fact, as the hymn writer has put it here, Isaac Watts, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. It's the grace of God by which we're saved. It's not our works. It's not our giving to God. It's what God has in his mercy given to us. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that text that we read just a few moments ago. We're looking at two verses in particular. The verse 4, which talks about how God established his covenant with the children of Israel to give them the land of Canaan. That's our principal focus. That's the covenant of the land in the past has been called the Palestinian covenant, though that is perhaps not a good title to give it in light of what's happening in Israel today, but the covenant of the land. And then we see another covenant given to us as we look where God says, I have remembered my covenant in verse 5, which was the covenant to Abraham to bring his children out of bondage in Egypt. You recall when the smoking furnace passed between the cut pieces of those slain animals, God had told him that there, his descendants would go down into Egypt and then 400 years later, he would bring them out and make them into a nation. And so God says, I remember that covenant with the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians have kept in bondage. And so as we looked very quickly in overview, there are nine specifically stated covenants between God and man in the Old Testament, not counting God's promises to the church in the New Testament, the church being a mystery. There's the Edenic covenant, the covenant of Eden before the fall. The Adamic covenant, the covenant that is with Adam right after the fall. The Noahic covenant, which is the covenant right after the flood. The Abrahamic covenant, which is first stated in Genesis chapter 12, a very important covenant that's mentioned in our text. Then there's the Mosaic Covenant, or we call it the Law, the Law given at Mount Sinai, which is a conditional covenant as opposed to an unconditional covenant. The conditional covenants can be broken, or excuse me, the unconditional covenants cannot be broken. The conditional covenants can be broken by men with resulting consequences. We saw that God taught Israel eight basic things with the law because the church is not under the law. But the Mosaic Covenant, that is the law, was made specifically with national Israel, not with the church. Two, the Mosaic Covenant, that is the law, governed national Israel as a redeemed people, but it was not given to them as a means of redemption. That took place when they crossed the Red Sea. God always points back to the Red Sea and the destruction of Pharaoh and his army with the closing of the waters as the point of the redemption of Israel as a nation. Third, the law was proof that all men are lost sinners. Fourth, the law is proof that man cannot save himself. Fifth, the law reflects the holiness of God who has an absolute standard of moral righteousness. Fifth, sixth, the law shows that man cannot attain the righteousness of God alone. Seventh, the law is neither a means of salvation or of sanctification. And finally, the church is not under the law, which is specifically stated in Scripture. John 1.17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Romans 6.14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. I don't know how people can read that any other way, but there are many in Reformed circles who still think that we're under the law. Romans 7, 4 through 6, and this is very important. I'm going to be building on this next little section this week, adding things that we did not have last week. But Romans chapter 7, verses 4 through 6. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh... The motions of sin, which were by the law, that's our contrast here, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held, the law is always seen as a, a picture of chains and bondage, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit. 
there is freedom in the spirit where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty and not in the oldness of the letter so many people think that by making sure that they've dotted all their I's and crossed all their T's that God must somehow be required to accept them but the law merely proves that all men are sinners for no man can keep the law it is to demonstrate that we are lost it is to demonstrate the holiness of God it is to demonstrate that we are desperately in need of grace it was not given as a means of salvation now these verses tell us those verses Romans 7 4 through 6 why it's so important that we are no longer under the law in fact did you pick it up I hope you did as we were going through God gave the basic foundational institution of marriage as to graphically illustrate why we are no longer under the law did you hear that you also become dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should be married to another even to him who is raised from the dead that's Christ and then the normal result of marriage that we should bring forth fruit unto God and then he contrasts it again in verse 5 and 6 where he says the motions of sin which were by the law did work members to bring forth fruit unto death but now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of the letter God used the basic foundational institution of marriage to graphically illustrate while we are no longer under the law now I'm going to digress for a few moments here which means that we may have to spend an additional week on the covenant of the land it was supposed to be four parts and um, <coughs> today was supposed to be the third part but we may not get all the way through that because of what I'm adding so we may have to add a fifth week on the covenant of the land but in this passage in Romans it's essential to understand how the law and grace relate to marriage this portion of the Bible says that marriage and widowhood were given by God as an illustration to show how we are no longer under the law that was our former husband because death and death alone has removed the marriage bond we are free in the eyes of God to be married to our heavenly bridegroom the Lord Jesus Christ whereas the law was a sterile and barren relationship producing no living children God's purpose for marriage was to produce the fruit of life that's the picture that Paul is giving to us here in Romans chapter 7 as in a fertile marriage with physical children the spiritual fruit of life is now possible in our new relationship with Christ by the living seed of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit who lives inside of each believer that's why being in a divine love relationship with God as we discussed last week is so much more powerful than merely slaving away under the law love is always more powerful than the law let me say it again love is always more powerful than the law you know I gave the illustration last week of the man in Florida a true illustration uh, who loved his little dog so much that he jumped on top of an alligator to try to rescue the dog now he would not have done that if the law of Florida required you to jump on top of alligators every time there was a dog in the jaws of an alligator it wouldn't happen the law is not strong enough to motivate you to do that but love did motivate him another illustration I think I also got this from Reader's Digest many years ago you can tell that as a young person I like to read these uh, especially the parts that were about true stories of life in the United States and things like that and uh, humor and uniform and various other portions of Reader's Digest I never read the things that they were summarizing books on but uh, I always liked those sections but another one that I read was uh, also from Florida a man who jumped into the water to save a child from a shark attack he did manage to rescue the child but the shark ripped out a major portion of the inside of his thigh and groin as he was rescuing the child love motivated him to do that not law dear people love is always love is always a stronger motivation than law love provides an overwhelming internal motivation rather than an external force 
God draws us gently, ever so gently and kindly, with what the Bible calls bands of love. You know the story of the book of Hosea, the prophet of God who had an unfaithful wife. And God uses that relationship to show how much he loved Israel in spite of her unfaithfulness to him. And as we move toward the close of the book, we read in Hosea chapter 11, verse 4, God speaking. He says, I drew them with cords of a man, with bands of love. And I was to them as they that take off the yoke on their jaws, and I laid meat unto them. The cords of a man, the bands of love. In modern terms, we would probably say that a man pulled on the heartstrings of the one that he loved until he drew her to himself in a genuine love relationship. You see, you cannot force love. You can force submission. You can force obedience. You can force an unwanted physical relationship. But you cannot force love. Love is won by kindness by gentleness, by tenderness, by patience, by sacrifice, by long suffering. Let me pause for a moment. Do you know the difference between long suffering and patience? Patience is putting up with difficult circumstances. Long-suffering is putting up with difficult people. That is a biblical distinction. Love is won by long-suffering. Love is won by giving. Love is won by faith and faithfulness. Love is won by integrity. Love is won by consistency. Love is won by self-control, not by grabbing what you want. Love is won by quietness. Love is won by prayer. In other words, love is won by persistent love on the part of the lover unless the love is rejected. That passage I just read a moment ago in Hosea adds two other things. After it describes how God drew Israel to himself, it says that God in love, quote, took off the yoke on their jaws. In other words, he removed the painful thing that bound them to their labor. In love, he gave them freedom. Working and serving God because you're forced to do it never produces the same results as working and serving God because you love him. For example, a husband who is required to work and serve long hours to pay alimony never does as much or with the same spirit as the husband who passionately loves his wife and children and who would give them everything that he has. Being forced to pay alimony by the law 
never brings joy or thanksgiving or peace or willing service. But being truly in love always brings joy and thanksgiving and peace and gentleness and sacrifice and faithfulness and willing service. That brings us to the second thing that is mentioned after that drawing that God does in love. The second thing that we see in this Hosea passage is that God says his love brought us, quote, and I laid meat unto them. Love always meets the genuine needs of the one who is loved. Young people especially remember this phrase, love is not selfish, love is sacrifice. Love is not selfish, love is sacrifice. Oh, how I wish that all of us could understand that. The one who loves will provide, and here the picture is the husband, for those who are under his authority. He will work. He will not be a bum. He will not sit around twiddling his thumbs and hoping that the woman will go bring in the food for him. Young people, there's another very important principle that I hope you memorize. The first, love is not selfish, love is sacrifice. But the second important principle about love and how to tell if something is lust or whether it is really love is this. Love can always wait to give. Lust can never wait to get. Love can always wait to give. Lust can never wait to get. Test your relationships by that. Love can always wait to give. Lust can never wait to get. Now, since we're talking about law and force versus grace and love, let me draw you to God's description of real love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, there are several different words that are used for love in the New Testament. There's eros, that's erotic, sexual love. There's phileo, that is friendship love. There is stergo, which is family love. And there is agape, which is divine love. The word translated charity in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is agape. That's the deepest, richest, most sacrificial love and that should be the goal of every Christian in all of his or her relationships. Agape, this kind of love is possible because we have received it from God. This kind of love is the kind of love that is transferable because God loves through us. We have empowered, been empowered for this kind of love by the Holy Spirit. We are motivated by this love because of the love that Christ had for us. And so here it is, the description of love. Paul first mentions the spiritual gifts which seem to get everybody so excited in the church, especially in the charismatic movement today. But that's not where it's at. Paul makes that point very, very bluntly in 1 Corinthians 15. True grace is not where the gifts are. True grace 
is where there is the manifestation of divine love. 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, that's agape love, I am become as a sounding brass, boom, or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, oh, isn't that impressive? I could stand up and tell you what's going to happen tomorrow in Gaza, or I could stand up tomorrow and tell you what's going to happen in Afghanistan. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, imagine that. I say, I'm tired of what's going on down at Town Hall. Town Hall, pick up yourself and jump into the river. And lo and behold, it does. Or to the Capitol in Washington, D.C. Or to the Supreme Court or whatever branch of government you don't like. Would that be impressive? Would everybody think, wow, he's got something? Paul says, though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity. That's God's kind of love. Our modern society has redefined the term charity so that it no longer holds its powerful original meaning. But that's agape love, God's divine kind of love. and have not charity. Imagine, you're a prophet. You have incredible faith and power to move stuff around. So if you don't have love, you are nothing. Does God put it on a higher level than the charismatic gifts, than the power gifts, than the impressive spectacular gifts? Yes. The manifestation of God's love is placed on the highest level and God has given you the ability to do it. It is transferable because God does it through you. Now the description. Oh, I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. There are a lot of generous people. A lot of people out there who think they're getting to heaven because they've given millions and millions and millions of dollars. Though I give my body to be burned, I will be a sacrifice. I will go up in flames as a martyr. And have not charity. It profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Remember I told you the difference between long suffering and patience. The first thing put in the list here is long-suffering. Charity suffereth long, that's long-sufferingness. First character quality is God's kind of love puts up graciously with difficult people. Not just with tough circumstances, with difficult people. The church is full of them. I should say the church is full of us. The second thing is, love is kind. Long suffering might be simply holding back and smiling as you put up with somebody, but kindness doesn't stay inside. Kindness reaches out. You know, that's one of the descriptions of the godly woman in Proverbs 31. It says, in her tongue is the law of kindness. In her tongue is the law of kindness. The Bible has a lot to say about the tongue. We can't deal with that today. But if you wonder what it has to say about the tongue, read the book of James. It's a world of fire. It's an iniquity. It's full of deadly poison. Anybody who can control the tongue is a mature Christian. People who don't gossip, people who don't slander, people who don't backbite, people who don't downcut, 
people who don't insinuate what's your tongue like charity envieth not charity remember we're talking agape love vaunteth not itself is not always pushing itself forward is not puffed up it's not a proud thing doth not behave itself unseemly that is in an inappropriate manner when I read this what comes to mind is a picture I saw I have no idea how many years ago of a man in a suit totally drunk at a party dancing on top of a table with a lampshade on top of his head <laughs> love is not unseemly seeketh not her own not always trying to get in first place not always trying to push itself where it gets something better than somebody else not always going to the head of the line and cutting in line and shoving others aside love is not easily provoked a slow answer turneth away wrath a soft answer he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty Love is not easily provoked. Love thinketh no evil. It doesn't always jump to the conclusion that the other person must be plotting against you. Something bad must be in their minds. They must be thinking something dirty about you. They must be really your enemies even though they're smiling at you and pretending to be your friends. Love thinketh no evil. If it comes, you're taken by surprise. Because you didn't assume. Love rejoiceth not in iniquity. It's not pleased either when it is involved in iniquity, that is moral turpitude, nor is it happy when somebody else gets caught in doing something sinful. Love rejoices in the truth. Jesus is the truth. Love beareth all things. Doesn't matter what comes. It takes the punch and rolls with it. Believeth all things. Love is motivated by faith and trust. Love hopeth all things. It knows that the plan of God will be fulfilled there is a blessed hope endureth all things it doesn't just take the initial brunt but it has long wear tread it keeps on going it keeps on going it keeps on going Love never fails. Does that put our love to the test? Our love for Christ, our love one for another, our love as husbands for wives, Our love as parents for children. Our love as children for parents. I hope you notice as we read through that passage how many of the character qualities of divine love parallel the fruit of the Holy Spirit which is given to us in Galatians 5. Do you know why it parallels so closely? Because love is the first part of the ninefold fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, beginning in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, you do not produce this in the flesh. He contrasts it with the works of the flesh. Your flesh will never produce this. No matter how nice the person is in the world who is unsaved, he cannot produce this. 
No matter how much it looks like the real thing, it's plastic. Because this is a work that the Holy Spirit does in the life of the believer. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. It expands from a center. You saw that. Here's love at the center. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. It expands to encompass those who are around you. Against such there is no law. You see, there's a contrast between the work of the Spirit and the work of the law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. The Spirit produces love, the flesh produces lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. That is the practice of daily Christian living. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. <laughs> Remember what Paul said back there in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is not easily provoked. And love does not provoke. Now listen carefully for a moment. This agape love that I've been talking about is what enhances all of the other kinds of love to their fullest extent. Remember I talked about four different kinds of love. This kind of agape love is what enhances all of the other kinds of love to their fullest extent. For example, first, this agape love is what fills and enriches erotic love in the context of marriage alone. All other expressions of eros outside of marriage are a cheap and counterfeit imitation. Young people especially don't fall for it. Eros, passionate love, outside of marriage, is selfish. Outside of marriage, eros is unfaithful. Outside of marriage, Eros is cruel. It will addict you. Just like the worst drugs. And they are cruel. And they will kill you. It will addict you, but it will leave you with a sense of broken emptiness. Like an empty bottle leaves a drunk on the curb. If you want true, rich, fulfilling sexual love, save it for marriage. Agape, God's divine love, will enrich Eros in that context to incredible heights that our sex-filled culture can never reach. Agape love affects the second type of love as well. Agape love is what deepens the love of friendship, phileo, with its most perfect meaning of trust, companionship, understanding, oneness of thought and spirit. Have you ever had a friend like that who, as you were speaking, was able to finish the sentence they knew exactly where you were going? Agape will deepen that love of friendship and agreement of purpose in laboring together for a common task and helping the other when one falls in sacrificing for the friend in time of need. It will deepen that friendship so that you never doubt 
that the friend has your back. Agape love enables brothers and sisters in Christ to truly love one another as Christ gave us commandment. It undergirds the love of friendship, phileo, that proves to the watching world that we are a covenant community of God's people. Third, this agape love is what undergirds, deepens, and enriches the love of family. You remember I talked about stergo. The natural affection such as a mother has for her children, both born and unborn. God has given a natural bond of love between parents and children, grandparents and grandchildren, brothers and sisters, to all people. But as we look around, we see that sin has marred this natural affection with mothers killing their unborn babies with children in rebellion against their parents, with parents abusing and molesting their children, with children retaliating against their parents with elder abuse and promoting physician-assisted suicide like one of the bills that is now before the New Jersey legislature. It came before the assembly back in June, you recall. It's back up again. Let me pause for just a moment to show how stergo, that is natural affection, love of family members, fits into the prophetic end times in which we're now living. There are two passages where stergo occurs in its negative form, astorgos. Two passages in the New Testament. Look how they tie into the end times and look how they tie into what's happening around us. The first passage is in Romans chapter 1 verse 31. Without understanding, covenant breakers, now here's our word, astergos, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. The second passage is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3. Here's our word, first in the verse. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Now what's the context of those two passages? The first verse, Romans 131, is prophetic, and it's in the context of a nation that has given itself over to normalizing sodomy, and it ends with the very next verse stating, who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. That without natural affection is one of the last four things that is said about a country and a culture that has given itself over to sodomy. Natural affection is a description of the divinely ordained family unit. One male father one female mother and children. Sodomy and lesbianism are not natural affection. Bestiality, necrophilia, pedophilia, incest, whoredoms, prostitution, and a hundred other perversions are not natural affection. They are unnatural affection. They are all in rebellion to the divinely established order. They are perverted, broken, decadent, and corrupt. And the Bible prophesies that they will increase in the last days. People, do you question that we are living in the last days? That second verse that I read a moment ago is also prophetic and describes the end times. Listen to the context. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. You remember how we talked about God's kind of love is not selfish? It's not a self-love. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Modern psychology tells you to be first and foremost a lover of yourself. 
covetous. Are there any bells and whistles that ring when we say the word covetous here in the United States? Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. One of the signs of the last days. You only have to go back 50 years before you find that the teenage rebellion that we see today was very uncommon. It was there, but if you look at today's culture, it has morphed into a culture of the youth, whereby everything is defined by the youth, and parents are set on the shelf. Disobedient to parents. Unthankful. We live in a country filled with ingrates. In a country filled with the welfare mentality, with the entitlement mentality, that is totally unthankful for what others do for them, they assume that they deserve it, and somebody has dissed them, that is, disrespected them, if they don't get what they want. Unholy. Do I need to say more? And then verse 3. Here it is, squarely in the middle. Without natural affection. Astorgos. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such. Turn away. He says that's what it's going to be like in the end times. Does that describe America? I hope you can see that it does. Did you notice verse 5? It's going to be in the church. Having a form of godliness, it will show up where it appears that worship is taking place. It shows up in what appear to be good, quote unquote, people. Having a form, an external appearance of godliness, but it's a hollow shell, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning very pompously about how much they know and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They know everything except the truth. Everything except the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres, the two magicians who were in Pharaoh's court, withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But how thankful I am for verse 9. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs, that is, the folly of Janus and Jambres, as theirs also was. The power of God ate up their silly little snakes. It's in that context that the Bible gives us the warning about persecution that we mentioned last week, if we're not politically correct. You choose not to be politically correct, you will be persecuted. We just heard, that was what was in the last days. We move directly into verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, and patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. That's what we've been preaching on on Sunday evening, is Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derby, false missionary journeys, the conversion of young Timothy. And he's writing to Timothy here and saying, you know that, you saw it. You experienced what was going on with me when I came to your town. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child 
Thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. I hope you recognize the fact that Satan is currently viciously attacking the family unit and this brings us back full circle to where I began with this little rabbit trail. He's attacking the family unit because that is the visible picture that God has given to portray the love relationship between Christ and his bride, the church. And the love that he, as a father, has for his children. Husbands, wives, children. That's the full complement of the divine family picture. Agape love is only possible for true Christians, although I must admit we don't always take advantage of it, but it is possible and it's available. But agape love is absolutely essential for a radically different family dynamic in which there is patience and gentle caring an extreme sacrifice. Where there is the gentle leadership and the teaching ministry of the father and husband. Where there is the loving and willing submission of the wife that does not have to be forced. Where there is a stable love between the parents that give the children a sense, a perfect sense of belonging and security. A love where there is discipline in love and an example of consistent holy living and life principles that are modeled by the parents. Agape love is what is necessary to have your family manifest the full range of God's love to us as his family. Did you notice something else as I went through all of that? All the other categories of love, eros, passionate love, phileo, friendship love, stergo, natural affection, all three of those are also designed by God as part of his plan for marriage. A Christian husband and wife should have true, passionate love one for another and for none other. A husband and wife should be the best friends in the world. I praise God that before she went to heaven, Judy was my best friend. My very best friend. And as for natural affection, a husband and wife will defend to the death one another and the children that God gives to them. They will sacrifice everything for the ones that they love. Philo, the love of friendship, underpinned and fulfilled by agape, is central for God's plan for the church. Loving one another as genuine friends, as well as brothers and sisters in Christ in all holy purity, shows the world what a difference being a Christian makes. Shows the world what it means to be in covenant community, one with another. What brother would not sacrifice and even die for his sister unless family love had been defaced by sin? But in the church, phileo, the love of true friendship is most fully expressed in the willingness to die for our friends. Jesus said it. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Well, this broader look at the law and force versus love and grace perhaps gives us some insight into why it's so important that the Bible tells us that we're not under the law, but under grace. People, that's not a theological distinction. That's a distinction that rattles the very foundation of the Christian life. Every area of your life is either controlled by love or by law. That's why it's so important to know that we're not under the law, 
but under grace. What a difference that relationship makes. Well, our time is up for today. That clock stopped, but I see the one in the back is a little over, and my watch says we're over also. So let's close there. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the great love for with Christ loved us. In the while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Love that does not merely love the lovely. Love that it loves and, and cares for the one who is filthy and dirty and wretched and miserable. The one who stinks. The one who's in rebellion. The one who has nothing. Nothing to give, nothing to offer, nothing in return. That's your love to us. Help us as Jesus commanded us to love one another, even as, in the same manner as, he loved us. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Since we have no accompanist today,